You know, Daniel and his friends have a lot to teach us. They once served him in a nation with a godly heritage amidst remnants of God-fearing culture. Now they must serve him in Babylon from inside a God-opposing and idolatrous pagan power. They might have wished with all their hearts that this new culture, this Babylon context would fail, would disappear, but Babylon wasn't going anywhere. So what shall we do? Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great joy to be here. Uh, it's not just a joy to be in Adelaide, but it's a joy to be back in Australia. Um, and uh, I am fast realizing that, uh, and apologies to my American friends who will watch this, uh, as wonderful as you are, uh, Australia is still home. And... Uh, <laughs> And that means I'm going to be looking for lots of excuses to come back. And thank you all for being my excuse this evening to be back in Australia. Um, you know, it's interesting when you run events around the country, every city has its own dynamic. Uh, you know, in Sydney, nobody shows up. Uh, it doesn't matter if they paid $100 for the ticket. They're just defeated at the last minute and they don't come. Um, you know, in Brisbane, everyone is unbelievably late. Um, you know, I'm talking 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, and I was wondering, what's the dynamic of Adelaide? And a friend of mine said, well, in Adelaide, people don't register until the day. <laughs> um, and it's interesting, you know, we launched these events and the others did pretty well, but no one was coming to Adelaide. And we thought, this is a gigantic failure. Do we have to cancel this? No one's coming. And then, of course, it sold out today. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, I know there are a few empty seats, but I think they're all Sydney siders who <laughs> booked tickets, moved here, and now can't be bothered coming out. Um, anyway, uh, back to something serious. So tonight, uh, what I would like to do, obviously, is talk a little bit about Daniel 3, uh, but more broadly about the theme of living in Babylon. Um, and, uh, and I want to not just talk about uh, sort of the out there aspect of this subject, looking at culture and all that. I actually want us all to go away this evening personally challenged uh, by uh, what we find particularly in Daniel chapter 3, uh, but also on the message of living in Babylon more broadly, which the whole book of Daniel is really a testimony to. And you might say to me, well, uh, why Babylon? Uh, well, uh, as I've said once before, Babylon is a place that also became a metaphor. And there's a lot that we can learn both from its historic realities as a place and from the metaphor that it became. So let's look first at the historic reality and see a couple of lessons. Um, I want us to consider the context in which Babylon appears in Scripture, especially as it is dealt with by the time we're in the book of Daniel. It, it occurs from the perspective of the Jewish people. Uh, they are living, as we know, in Jerusalem, uh, which is their promised land. They are God's chosen nation. They have a temple that is built to His blueprint, a moral law and a civil code written and enforced according to His blueprint, a communal and a social life based on religious feasts and ceremonies, and a long heritage of God's powerful protection and blessing against the odds. It was a culture that was built on the basic foundation of the fear of God and all that He had given them. Um, there is a sense in which there's a, a similarity, a parallel here. For us who live in a Christian culture, or at least a culture that has foundations and blueprints that are heavily influenced by Christianity and the Bible, um, in fact, those principles remain woven into so much uh, of our culture, and people don't really know it, and we take a lot of things for granted that come from a Christian heritage. Uh, we have institutions that are, are full, I mean, even little things like the fact that we call uh, our senior politicians ministers, which is the word that is given to the governing authorities in Romans 13. Uh, you know, it's everywhere. Uh, there's a similarity here. Uh, there wasn't a Christian culture back then because Christ did not come, uh, but there is a similarity, a Christian culture and a God-fearing 
culture, at least in its foundation. But of course, we know the problem. It goes wrong over time. People stray, the government corrupts, everyone is forgetful, things are falling to pieces as they forget where they've come from, uh, and the foundations are good, but they're drifting from them. And again, does that remind you in some way of the West? Uh, a bastion of Christianity, uh, sent missionaries to the whole world, uh, biblical and Christian foundations permeate everything, a society that once cared about aligning itself with the Bible, with the Word of God, with God's will and God's ways, a society that wrote a constitution for Australia that said that we were relying on the blessing, the humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God uh, in the union of the colonies to form the Commonwealth of Australia. Um, we too have drifted as they had. And there's another similarity. In the Jewish experience, suddenly along comes an empire with a very different culture, a pagan empire founded on pagan principles, uh, governed by pagan institutions, revolving around the worship of idols. This is Babylon uh, that suddenly appears. And of course, Babylon does something which the Jewish people thought was completely unthinkable, which is that Babylon conquers Judah, destroys Jerusalem's temple, and takes away many of the survivors to live in the city of Babylon as captives. And that's the point at which the book of Daniel begins. And so the survivors, Daniel being one of them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being three more, they may well ask, well, what now? We're living in Babylon now, not Jerusalem. So the context in which God's people must serve Him has changed entirely. They once served Him in a nation with a godly heritage amidst remnants of God-fearing culture. Now they must serve Him in Babylon from inside a God-opposing and idolatrous pagan power. They must work out how can they serve God in a new culture. Because they might have wished with all their hearts that this new culture, this Babylon context would fail, would disappear, but Babylon wasn't going anywhere. She was there to stay for a while. And for the God-fearing individual like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, their society is different, their context has changed. So there are ongoing similarities. We too are being engulfed rapidly in an entirely new culture. It's not a conquest of military power, but it is a conquest of ideology. It's a wave of something. I think people use the word woke to try and give it a name. But it's lots of things really. I mean, you've got things wrapped up in it like critical theory, which is really a deconstruction of Christianity, which is looking for oppression and power and systems and all the oppression and the power and the systems is conveniently Christianity in the West, uh, and so it all needs to be destroyed. Uh, it's got postmodernism in there, you know, this idea that, well, uh, the truth is not really relevant to my experience, my experience is more important, that might be true, but this is how I feel, so that's how I'll live. Uh, postmodernism gets rid of the author of truth and makes you the author of truth, makes everything subjective. Uh, extreme individualism, the rise and triumph of the modern self, to quote Carl Truman. Um, the idea that I am here for myself, to live my best self, to self-fulfill and self-ideate and have a good time all by myself, um, or something like that. I don't, I don't fully understand it, but that's the sort of way they talk about it sometimes. Um, Neo-paganism even. Uh, you know, the exaltation of created things as sort of intrinsically spiritual, like the environment, the planet. Uh, and you know, for the observers, you might have seen something recently, uh, just occasionally lately, just occasionally, particularly if you're watching like Hollywood and pop culture, something actually satanic pops to the surface. Like someone gets up in a Baphomet costume and you're all going, what? What's that? Uh, and there's a little bit of that going on as well. It's a wave of something, I don't know the word, but whatever it is, it's post-Christian. And it doesn't seem to be going away. We may wish it away. We may have dreams of 
I don't know, some new political party being established that's full of really great people that's going to suddenly become one of the big two and rule the nation and restore us all to righteousness. The problem is I look at my generation, millennials, and the generation below me, Generation Z, and I go, no, that's not going to happen. Um, Babylon is here to stay for a while. This new culture is here to stay for a while. So what should we do? You know, Daniel and his friends have a lot to teach us, a lot, because they've trod this path before us. They've gone this way before us. And I'll tell you one thing before I get into the guts of this. One thing that they didn't do, that they didn't do, um, they didn't spend a lot of time commiserating. Uh, Some of the Jews did commiserate. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept as we remembered Zion. I nearly sung it, um, (laughs) but you'll all be glad that I didn't. Uh, That's a psalm, it's not just the song. And you know, that's normal and human in one sense. We can can mourn for things past, there's a time and a place for that. But there is also a trap of being overwhelmed with misery and bitterness and resentment of this new world order and a misery that dwells on former things and never comes to terms with the way things are. I say this because I saw a lot of it in my political work over recent years. I came to the realization that there are people simply miserable about the world that they felt that they had lost. And some live always on nostalgia, some live in scoffing and criticism, observing all that is wrong all the time, And an odd one, some just actually resent youth. Um, Some are just unhappy and they never seem to be able to let it go and move forward. And notice in that psalm what these people are doing as they're mourning for what's been lost, they're doing doing nothing, they're sitting down. It's a state of paralysis. It's a paralyzing condition to be in. And it's okay to be paralyzed for a little bit when you're sad, but you need to come out of that paralysis. And Daniel's perspective is quite different. It's a refreshing perspective by comparison. He reflects on what happened uh, and and, and he gives to us just the perspective that he's gained on it in a few sentences at the start of the book of Daniel. He's kind of gotten over himself and he sees a bigger picture and he describes the advent of this new era into which he has been thrown in this way. He says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. In other words, he is saying, this is the day that the Lord has made. That's his perspective. He's saying, whatever condition I found myself in, God has permitted it. Whatever the situation, God has something for me to do. Um, And what follows is an unfolding of the forward movement of the kingdom of God through Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in this brand new context, whilst Babylon is here for a while. That was their calling, that, this was their time. And it's your time and it's my time as well. Um, you know, it's one of the favorite verses of Christians at the moment. You, you hear it repeated, actually it's in America and here, uh, for such a time as this. Uh, People will look at someone they admire or they'll see a great thing happen and they say, oh, for such a time as this. And I want to say, you know, have you ever considered that actually it applies to every one of us here tonight? You were born. You are saved. You are being equipped for such a time as this. And Daniel and his friends embrace the call and they step forward in obedience and amazing things happened in Babylon. Let's not be stuck in misery over the past such that we can't see the amazing things that can happen by God's grace and God's work through His servants in Babylon. There's some lessons from history, historical context, parallels if you like. But you know, Babylon also um, became a metaphor. Um, This label Babylon, I say that because uh, Babylon is applied to places other than the Babylon, Tyre and Nineveh and Rome are all called Babylon in Scripture. Uh, The city of Babel is connected very explicitly with Babylon in several places. Uh, That was the first Babylon culture and we learn a lot from its philosophy. I spoke on that in Sydney a little while ago. 
Um, but also, uh, there's a Babylon culture, again, a Babylon in the book of Revelation, uh, the last Babylon culture, if you like, and where that is exactly, um, we don't need to get into it tonight, or we will be here a long time, uh, and a lot of people might get very upset, um, so maybe on another occasion. Um, but this has even caught on in the modern world. Uh, there's a nightclub in Brisbane called Babylon. Um, not that I've been, but it's a funny story. I was speaking at a pro-life fundraiser, and it happened to be in a venue booked next door to Babylon. Uh, and by the time it came uh, for me to get up and give my speech, uh, the music really started to ramp up, and it was kind of moving the wall. Uh, and so I had to, uh, I was being drowned out by Babylon in my pro-life speech. Um, but you see, it's caught on. There's a Hollywood blockbuster movie uh, with very famous people in it called Babylon. Um, what does it mean? Well, when you look at the examples in the Bible, you see that it actually is a certain kind of culture. And the first feature of this certain kind of culture is that it is built on human pride. And you see that actually articulated by the builders of the city of Babel when they say, come, let us make a name for ourselves. That's their founding philosophy. The greatest thing in this culture, in this civilization, is ourselves, the self. Uh, and of course, once you start going down that dangerous line, and we have today, as we're about to see, but once you start going down that dangerous line, you realize that actually it leads you very quickly into a kind of rebellion. Uh, it's a culture which in its pride openly starts to raise itself up against God, and that's the biblical language. Daniel 5 uses that phrase. It tries to become God-like. That's actually the meaning of their project, to build a tower whose top will reach into heaven. These people want to climb onto God's throne and rule with His authority. Babylon wants the power of the state to be as high as it gets, not subject to God and His authority, Babylon wants to flex its power and compete with God by redefining those things that only God can define. Ken has already mentioned some. Uh, there are many, but think of obvious ones. Marriage. Who can define it? Not me, not you, not the state. It was created. Um, gender. Now, that's my sense of who I am, but God made gender. God made a male, and he made female, and he told us what it meant. Family is being redefined, something that only God has the power to define. Human life is being redefined. It sort of starts whenever we want it to start now. If we feel like we want this life, then it's a life that must be protected. If we feel like we don't want this life, then, well, it's our right to terminate it. Um, it's the same, too, increasingly at the end of life. Life not valued as God valued it. Uh, one of the things that stands out, actually, in the first nine chapters of Genesis is the incredible importance and value that God puts on a human life. Um, it's only human life that is described. I, I say this in my book. Here we go. My book. Uh, available outside. Uh, <laughs> it is made in God's image. No other life is described that way. What an extraordinary thing. Made to image God Himself. It's incredible. Also made with life that is directly breathed in by God. Nothing else was made that way. And, you know, that's why we actually possess in our being two kinds of life. Uh, we have a, a biological life which dies once the chemical reactions and the pieces that hold it together fail. But there's another life that hasn't failed. We all have an eternal life, a soul. Um, and I think everybody's aware of this. Uh, this is why people always wonder, what happens after you die? Because they know they're more than biology. They know they're more than chemical reactions. People wonder about things spiritual because they know that they belong to two places, here and somewhere else. Um, human life is so important, and, and in Genesis 9, God gives the hierarchy uh, where he says, you know, uh, if a human kills a human, then the death penalty is justified. If an animal kills a human, then the animal should also suffer death. Uh, but 
No human shall shed the blood of another human. Um, but also, humans can eat animals for food. It's all in Genesis 9. It's like he's saying, the whole creation look up to human life as valuable. But we've redefined that. We're changing those things that only God has the power to define. Uh, it's interesting, the Romans 1 example is the human sexuality example. However we may feel, um, God has designed us a certain way for a certain sexuality. Uh, and Romans 1 makes the point that's quite obvious from creation, from biology, that that is the case. Um, but again, we are redefining that which only God has the authority to define. And it is Babylon, it's the culture that we're in, flexing its muscles and trying to compete with God for His power. It is wanting to sit on the throne of God as Creator and redesign the natural order and the world of things which God has already defi de de defined. And of course, the end is going to be dreadful misery, and it already is becoming dreadful misery. Um, but this is where we are. Um, Babylon also wants to flex its power and compete with God by taking control of ultimate things uh, like that only God can control, uh, like the destiny of the planet. I mean, rest in the confidence that this planet isn't going anywhere until God is done with it. Uh, and when He's done with it, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be fine. Uh, this is a hope that we have which stands in stark contrast to a world of people who wonder how long, who wonder when will it burn, who wonder how fast can we destroy it. Um, Babylon is too big for its boots. It wants God's authority and this is a cultural reality. It's interesting though, Babylon might have this pride, which is that the self is the greatest thing, it might uh, have this rebellious bent to rule with God's authority, uh, but also, weirdly enough, uh, this, there's a strange paradox, which is that it's a culture which when you scratch below the surface, it's very afraid. Its vaunted pride is a cover-up for anxiety, because people know that we are not God. We can never replace God. We can't survive on our own power and our own schemes. The city of Babel expressed this when they admitted that what they were doing was an anxiety response, lest we be scattered abroad across the face of the earth, they said. A world of forces too big for us. Well, yeah, they're not too big for God, but you've forgotten about Him. And I just mentioned the climate issue. I mean, we know that children are going to psychiatrist's offices with anxiety about the destiny of the planet. Um, you know, the reality is, uh, this is the most anxious and depressed generation that the West has ever raised. Uh, even though life has, materially speaking, never been better. Uh, you know, I reflected on that and it occurred to me, if I thought that this enormous and unthinkably complex world of cause and effect and forces and powers, you know, that are inter interstellar and that are, that are beyond the atmosphere of this world and that, you know, the climate is controlled by things as far away and beyond me as the sun itself uh, and life itself every day is what? It's a random chance occurrence of many things and it's all up to me to find the power and the wisdom and the wits and the, and the nows to try and navigate through it all and not get taken out by a bus and all the rest of it. If I really thought that it was all up to me in the face of all this, I'd be very scared too. And I might not know why, and I think a lot of people don't know why, but the loss of that bedrock that you know there is power and control beyond you is a devastating thing in every Babylon. Uh, praise God these things are beyond my jurisdiction and power, but it's not beyond His. And that's why Jesus could say to His follower, do not be anxious. Is that an extraordinary statement? Um, I was about to say it's a bit stressful, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it makes you realize that it must be possible in sanctification to have anxieties diminished uh, and reduced in time. I'm sure it's complex, but it's real, uh, because Christ is in control and we know that He is in control for good. Uh, but see, Babylon, yeah, it's uh, proud, it's rebellious, it's anxious. Uh, there's two little things I want to mention before I move on about how it affects our experience as people who serve the true God. And the first thing is that it, 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 is, it is hostile. 
Babylon is a culture that is hostile to those who serve God. It, it says in Revelation, concerning that last Babylon, it says that she is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Uh, she is going after them. Um, and you know, it's interesting, it's not that Bab the Babylons of this world are hostile to everything Christianity stands for. Uh, you can say God loves you and no one minds. Uh, and it's true. Um, although, the fact is that He has loved us in a certain manner, which is that while we were yet sinners, this is how he, God demonstrates His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. That's His love. It's not that He feels all warm and fuzzy and squishy towards us all the time. We are sinners. We do rebel. But He has done an incredible act of love towards us all. Now, you can say that, and it's not such a big problem. But what is the problem is when you start to say things about a God who has something to say about Babylon's idols. It's interesting, today, really the problem comes when you bear testimony to a Creator God who has something to say about all the things that we are trying to grasp by our own power, pretending that we are the Creators. It's, it's all the things I talked about already. Why do you think these are so seldom talked about? Because these are the things that raise Babylon's hostility. Because you are poking Babylon's idols when you say that God has a design for human sexuality. God created male and female. You know, God has the destiny of the planet in His hand. Uh, when you say all this unbelievably incendiary stuff in our culture. It's all true, but the reason it's hated is because the hostility of Babylon comes against her idols. Um, but also, people say to me very often, they say, well... Um, do you think that this hostility is going to get worse in our day, if this is the way these sort of anti-God cultures go? Do you think the hostility is going to get worse? And the short answer is actually, I don't really know. Because Babylon doesn't necessarily bludgeon us into submission. It doesn't necessarily give us an actual fiery furnace to be thrown into by a megalomaniac. I mean, that hasn't happened. Um, because there's another tool in the arsenal, and the tool is seduction. You know, Babylon is a very good time. It's a prosperous and it's a powerful culture. And one of the things about all those cultures that are called Babylon in Scripture is that prosperity and wealth and a good life is available to the common man. That's not normal in history. The elites can, but it's interesting in the West, most people have access to something to have a good time and a good life. Most people have some bread and circuses. Um, and you know, when people are prospering, when people are fat and happy and comfortable, uh, when people have a wide social circle and a peaceful life and a career and respectability, they forget about God. Babylon is one. And here's the thing, Babylon says you can keep enjoying all that. So long as you don't color outside the lines of our culture. So long as you don't say all those things you just said, you can have all of that. And see how we're seduced? We go quiet, because we know what the cost is. And she seduced us. Uh, and in Revelation, that's why she's depicted as a great prostitute, and it goes into some detail there. Uh, and finally, remember this, Babylon ends. It's a culture that is judged. It will be brought down from its pride and destroyed by the hand of God Himself. That happened to the city of Babel. The pride gets to a certain point, the damage gets to a certain point, and God says, justice is better than mercy, it's time to end it. It happened to Babylon in Daniel's day. Uh, Daniel 5, I'll be speaking about that in Brisbane. Um, it always happens. So in summary, these are cultures that show human pride, rebellion against God, anxiety, hostility to the people of God, seduction of the people of God, and they are judged. In Daniel 3, we're confronted with Babylon's pride first and foremost. Uh, and it's actually a pride which we find shocking. It's manifested by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And this man is making himself God. Um, and he's a man of unpredictable and vicious violence and megalomania. And now he's demanding people's worship. 
Now, he sets up a golden image. Is it a golden image of himself? We don't know, but he's still demanding to control people's worship. Um, whatever Nebuchadnezzar did and said was the law of the land. There was no rule of law in those days like we have today, where uh, even the government is supposed to be subject to the law. Uh, not in Nebuchadnezzar's day. Whatever he said was the law. Um, you know, it's interesting actually on that, this is a siding, but I'll say it, um, with Darius, uh, it's interesting, he signs a decree and then he can't defy the decree that he signed, even though he's the king, because Medo-Persia did have somewhat of a rule of law system. It's very interesting when people, the historians find that out and you go and look at the Bible, there's always these little details make you go, oh, I didn't realize when I was a kid, I wondered why Darius just didn't do what he wanted. And we're like, no, nah, I'm not throwing him in the lion's den. He couldn't. He was subject to his own law. Um, anyway, just an interesting aside. There's much like that in the book of Daniel. Uh, details that just, you know, for example, they always said there was, ne there was no King Belshazzar. He didn't exist. Until, of course, there was an archaeological discovery in which it was all about King Belshazzar. Uh, and then uh, they said, well, he wasn't the king. Uh, he was the prince. Uh, but then they realized that actually the king, Nabonidus, went to Egypt and appointed Belshazzar as co-regent in his place. And see, the detail that's relevant in Daniel 5 is that he says to Daniel, you'll be the third ruler in the kingdom. Not the second, because you can't give that away. He's the second. You're the third. Little details all the way through. Anyway, slight aside. Um, back to Nebuchadnezzar, pride. He's got a kind of the king is God level of unvarnished pride. And um, we look at that and it sort of takes our breath away and we shake our heads. But the fact is, pride is in the fabric of our modern day Babylon as well even if it's different in its manifestation. We are still reaching up to the throne of God into heaven in our day to take control of things that only God has control of. And it's not merely the king that's doing it and imposing it on the people. The whole culture is doing it with one accord. That's the difference. We've individualized the ethos of Babel, come, let us make a name for ourselves. We've made that our personal creed. What do I mean? Well, we live in a culture where, I mean, just think about this. What do I, people say, really, is that true? Well, let's start here. Let's start with the fact that we live in a culture where it is possible to have many colorful, celebratory parades and festivals in all our cities, which take place under a banner which literally says what? Pride, literally. Pride is a movement. Pride is a brand. Pride is a good time. Pride is life advice. Pride is marketing. Pride is exalted among the people as a virtue. And you know, when you say it that bluntly, it's rather confronting. Uh, it's almost as confronting to people in other generations as what Nebuchadnezzar did, isn't it? It's almost as crazy to take pride, a dreadful sin, and turn it into this. Um, Our pride is no less wicked than Nebuchadnezzar's because it is also a pride of defiance against God. It is a pride which ultimately makes this call, whatever God has said, it must give way to who I say that I am. And we've set up a pantheon of golden images today to which we are all expected to bow. It's a series of golden images which are Images erected to reverence of our identities. It's interesting, you look at the legal system. Um, it was once the case in Western cultures like Australia where we had blasphemy laws. You couldn't insult God. It was illegal. Um, and there's a whole debate about whether they should come back. I'm not getting into that, I'm not sure. But the fact is, today, we don't have those. But we have vilification laws, which really makes it a crime to insult or blaspheme someone's identity. Um, I mean, that's where we are. I, I just, you know, images are identity-based images, and everybody knows, I mean, especially if it's the golden LGBTQ, everybody knows that if you don't bow, it's not going to be a great time. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that someone's going to get real angry real quick. Um, sort of the social code that we're currently living in. Uh, I just had my first book published, as I mentioned, Who Am I? And I make an observation, 
We live in days when the foundation from which we live our lives tends to be ourselves. You know, it's easy for me, I pointed at the movement that marches under the banner of pride to make a point, but I, I don't want us to be happy to stop there. I don't want to just point out of ourselves. Um, actually, that movement didn't become so socially acceptable in a vacuum. It became socially acceptable in a cultural soup that made it possible. A cultural soup in which we are all living, which threatens to shape us all. Uh, a, a culture which I call, uh, an idea which I call the identity theory of life, which starts with the question, who am I? Go to a government primary school, they're asking it pretty early. Or elementary school, if anyone from America watches this. Um, and you know, we are answer that question by means of an inward look, looking at ourselves. We dig around in our internal psychology to come up with answers. Uh, and you know, once we have those answers, we say, well, this is just who I am. And we tailor every aspect of our lives to complement ourselves. We pursue a life that is made in our own image. My career choice stems out of who I am. My, marital partner is, my marriage partner is about completing me. Uh, my spare time is me time. Me first, others and God last. I do what's right for me rather than actually bending my will to submit to what is right or even admitting what is right. Um, I create my truth rather than submit myself to the truth. Even church is a space for me. I go there to get my spiritual needs met. And we start hearing language. I don't know if you've heard this one. Uh, I've heard it a few times now. Um, that I need to feel seen. I need to feel seen. In other words, the world needs to revolve around me. Life is about being my best self. In other words, it's all about me. And the key to wisdom, you know, Proverbs was written, right? What did the writer of Proverbs say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. He says, you know, if you want to learn anything, don't start with yourself, go to God. Um, do you know, I think if Proverbs was written by a modern writer, it would be something like, follow your heart is the beginning of wisdom. Would it not? I mean, yeah, it's all about what comes out of the heart of man, the self. Uh, and of course, we've forgotten that Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, what does come out of the heart of man lists about 25 sins. Um, it says, these things come out of a person and defile them. So we're locking people into this inward look at their sinful self and saying, whatever's in there, you go for it. Live your best life, you do you, you know, and all this stuff, all these buzzwords of the day. Um, I heard a, well, here's one of the worst examples, and I have read this multiple times now. Jesus died on the cross because he thought you were worth it. Can I make a point about that? The wonder of Christ's work on the cross is not that you were so good that Jesus died for you. The wonder of the work on the cross is that you were so bad and Jesus died for you anyway. It's not about you, it's about Him. <clears throat> I mean, God demonstrates His love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's about His character, not our character, not who we are. Uh, I actually uh, was uh, in a conversation with a guy recently and he does a lot of work, apologetics work, with young people who are questioning. Uh, and they're often from Christian backgrounds, and he said he was interacting with a young woman who had become so allergic to Christianity that she couldn't even touch a Bible. And so he printed out the Gospel of John on A4 pieces of paper, removed the verses and the chapters and the reading aids and just had text. Uh, and he printed that out and he gave it to her and he said, I want you to go away and read this, come back to me tomorrow and tell me what it's about. Um, and so she went away and she came back the next day and she started her answer with the words, I feel like it's talking about my, and he cut her off, he said, wrong, go and read it again. She said, oh, okay, went away, came back, this true story by the way, came back the next day uh, and, uh, and she started the explanation by saying, I feel like it's explaining why I, and he cut her off, wrong, go and read it again. And he said she came back seven times. And on the eighth time, she came back quite, you know, she's bewildered on number seven, but she came back an eighth time and he said, well, what's it about? And she said, it's not about me, is it? <laughs> I said, correct. <laughs> the implications for us are enormous. It's not about us. It's not what God has done in Jesus Christ. You know, we live in 
a culture that says from every angle and every platform, it's about you. And it's rubbing off on us all, I am sure. Uh, Jordan Peterson got this one right when he said, excessive preoccupation with the self is indistinguishable from misery. <laughs> it's the curse of social media, isn't it? Everything you post can become a 24-hour preoccupation with yourself. Checking the likes, you know, middle of church, how we doing? Uh, <laughs> pondering your popularity, reading the comments, looking for little sugar hits of nice things people are saying, agreement, and then you read the bad ones, you think, oh, what's wrong with them? I mean, what a jerk. And, you know, the compliments go to your head and the insults go to your heart. Uh, I think that's a Dennis Prager line. Even though they're often not even true, you know, oh, you're so gorgeous, babe. <laughs> they're saying you don't threaten them. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of just people saying what they want, what they should say rather than telling the truth. But it's made a generation, it's made us all more interested in ourselves. I, 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 I am working hard on just getting myself off my own social media pages. Um, it's helpful, let me tell you. Um, you know what's becoming one of the most common questions I get asked privately? It's interesting, this has been a real surge. How can you spot a narcissist? Isn't it interesting that people would start uh, be asking that a lot lately? Um, we live in a culture of narcissism. It's everywhere. It's in the air we breathe. You know, it's just the psyche that makes a person ultimately consumed with that aspect of human pride that makes themselves the highest value. Let us make a name for ourselves, but hidden under layers and layers of complexity, right? Uh, very hard to spot, very complicated. But that's the heart of the issue. Um, and, and you know, that is the opposite of Christ. It is literally taking Christ and turning it in, Him inside out and making yourself the center of everything and covering it up and lying and deceiving to sort of keep yourself in that position. Um, it is so wicked and it causes such damage and it immiserates so many people when someone is ruled by themselves. You know, Satan and Narcissus are the same person. I think actually, you know, uh, it's interesting for a long time I used to think, oh, it's interesting we don't see much demonic activity in our day. Uh, you know, over, over in Africa and that, they have all the witch doctors and the weird voodoo stuff going down. Uh, you know, last 50 years in the West, where do you see that kind of weird stuff? You know, I just think that Satan's clever. He knows what's going to work. He knows what culture uh, receives what demonic influence. And this narcissistic tendency is satanic. It's a demonic affliction. Um, we are now at the point where we must take who I am right down to my lusts and my instincts and make it the guiding star of my life. And everyone must accept it. All must celebrate it. All must indulge it, and people who don't are bigots, and they hate me, and they're erasing me, and they're, you know, making me not seen, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and God cannot oppress me or offend me by saying that I'm wrong. It's no wonder people are unteachable, people don't listen, because people refuse to be offended. But here's the thing, the costs to this kind of culture, yeah, we can look at all the psychological costs, we can look at all the social costs. Uh, but we shouldn't really make that the priority. The priority is our spiritual cost. It's interesting, what does God say? He says, I dwell, he says, I dwell in the high and holy place and with Him who is of a humble and a contrite spirit. Jesus said as the first beatitude, the first character quality in His kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, um, Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of humility. But just a bit of this pride culture threatens to rub off on us all. And the problem we have is that we're not so stupid as to bow to like a Nebuchadnezzar image, but we are stupid enough to bow to our own image. Um, and that's what we so often do. And you know, uh, that's Babylon's pride. It's interesting. 
The hostility of Babylon is kindled against people who speak against these idols of identity in particular, who speak in this way. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego saw in their own context. They spoke against the idol and the hostility that we spoke of before was kindled against them. Um, you imagine the pressure that was faced by them. Imagine the scores of satraps, prefects, governors, counselors, treasurers, justices, magistrates and officials, as the text says on more than one occasion. You know, I tell you one thing, it's very, very, very hard to be out of step when you're in that crowd. These are the people who control the reins of power of the known world, and you either belong or you don't, right? Uh, I saw something of this over the last 10 years or so. They can control your destiny. How conspicuous these guys must have been in that place when everyone's down on their faces, standing up. And notice a few things about the situation. The first one is that they seem to be alone. The accusation comes against certain Jews. Which Jews? Well, only three out of all those people. Actually, in Daniel 5, the ratio is a thousand to one. A thousand lords at the feast, Daniel not at the feast. Um, these three loners, however, these three sort of outcasts who have hostility kindled against them, remember they're maliciously accused, that's a quote from the text. Um, these three lives that are on the line, who stand to lose their careers, who stand to you know, lose out in the face of those who command the levers of the world's power, which was what Babylon was, it was these three that God Himself saw and chose to leave the glory of heaven to stand with them in that fire. And the lesson is this, never, ever, 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 ever go by the counting of heads in the service of God. Never. Never be ashamed of being alone. Because if you do right, you are never alone. You are in the best company in the world. Notice also, they're not just lonely, well, not really, as we just saw, but they're also prospering. And I do wonder sometimes whether this is one of the reasons the trial, trials can come to people, because they're prospering, they're comfortable. Um, but if they're prospering and they have so much, they're officials in the government and all this kind of stuff, um, they have a lot to lose. And the cost of not compromising is enormous but the benefit of compromising seems great because they could just carry on and enjoy all the benefits. And I call this a Babylon choice. And you know, all of us face, will face, if we haven't already, Babylon choices in our life. All of us will face moments where we need to make a decision, we need to say something, we need to stand apart and refuse to be with the crowd, and the consequence will be that something of Babylon's good times and good things will no longer be yours. And this is what happened to Daniel on day one in chapter one. Eat the king's food, can't do that. Oh man, talk about messing it up straight away. Uh, giving up his place in Harvard University and the White House, which is the equivalent of what he had. Why? Over food. Well, he had a Babylon choice, didn't he? The fiery furnace, a Babylon choice. Bow to the image, worship a false god, or go along with what's happening here, or lose a lot. The lion's den, another Babylon choice. Um, this is Babylon's hostility and Babylon's seduction coming together in a really nasty way. Um, it's interesting, we live in a Western culture and it has prospered us. Um, it has for a long time. Uh, the value of the family home has gone up a lot. Superannuation scheme has been pretty effective for many people. You know, there's a long time where the strong Christian who confesses Christ and believes the Bible and preaches in church on Sunday and leads an upstanding life can nonetheless have a good name, be socially integrated, be held in high regard, enjoy professional standing and lose very little most of the time. And that's the thing that's slowly changing. The problem is that we know, many of us, that there could be a day, and some of you in your professional contexts know this, some of you who are about to go to university know this, there could be a day when Babylon walks straight up to you and says, hey, you, yes, you, bow to my idols. 
and you've got a Babylon choice. You can either go along with it, not stand out, and enjoy Babylon's rewards, or you can stand with these men and say no. Um, this is happening to Christian individuals, it's happening to Christian institutions, school boards, change your gender policies, or else be the next one in the media, face a lawsuit, be called hateful. The campus ministry, say nice things about diversity, equity and inclusion, or else lose volunteers, become unpopular on campus. Um, the public servant, wear purple tomorrow, or else stand out, or else have to give an account for yourself, or else maybe miss a promotion or six. Um, but interesting, you know, here's an interesting one that I, I want to point out. The young person who's going into the workforce fresh or going into university, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a crucial moment. Uh, and the choice is a little more subtle here. The choice is going to be, it's going to be uh, partake in the same social contexts, go to the same places, enjoy the same entertainment, laugh at the same jokes, be integrated with the crowd in the corporation, in the university, in, and that's how you're going to belong. I mean, that's really the problem, right? And you all know that to stand apart from that could carry a cost. I mean, that itself is a Babylon choice. You know, suddenly so many of the things that were compatible with our prosperity are becoming threats to our prosperity. And there's a wave of compromise on all of this going right across the culture. Over and over again, institutions, individuals, just buckling when the pressure is on. For what? Fear of a burning, fiery furnace? No. Fear of reproach. Fear for reputation, fear of losing an easier life. Rarely does it come to more than that. Um, you know, we instinctively pray for Christians under persecution. I think we need to pray for Christians under seduction. Uh, it's interesting, I met with a guy, um, a guy, the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Sydney. Um, <laughs> pardon me, Your Grace. Um, I met with him in Sydney, in Western Sydney, uh, some time ago, and he had actually come from Iraq, and he was the Archbishop of Mosul in Iraq, and he was one of the last people out of Mosul when ISIS came in. He'd seen people die, uh, all sorts of shocking things, uh, and he'd come to Sydney as a refugee under the program that was in place at the time, became Catholic Arch the, the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Sydney. I think that's an Orthodox church, I think that's the one that's actually Orthodox, someone might correct me, but anyway, even though it's called Catholic. Anyway, I was talking to him and I said, well, um, out of interest, what was better for you, Mosul or Sydney? And before the words were even out of my mouth, he said, Mosul. I said, oh, why? He said, well, he said, in Mosul, the choice was very easy. Live or die. He said, in Sydney, you people have a third option, compromise. And you know, there's a sense in which metaphorically, we compromise because we're not prepared to die. We're not prepared to lose. We're not prepared to die to ourselves, die to what's around us, and live for Christ. Um, and you know, these men, they faced what they faced, I believe, of such epic magnitude, because we're probably never going to have to face that. And if they can do it by the power of God, so can we um, deal with our situation. Um, let me get into their reply. I'm going to be over time here. Sorry, whoever's monitoring the time, but I, I need to land the plane. Um, I want you to note what they did, their decision. It says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, God will answer you. He'll provide his own answer. In other words, they've committed themselves entirely to God's hands. And it's interesting, you might say to yourself, I could never do that. I could never go through that trial. I could never deal with that cost. You must never judge what you could be able to do under trial based on who you are today. Because if you do right, God will help you. If you are one man or woman doing right in the face of a thousand, the fourth man will join you in the fire. Don't ever judge your ability based on who you are now. They committed themselves to God and that's what we must do as well. And it's interesting, 
When you do the right thing and you leave the consequences with God, they're pretty much never what you expect. You read through Daniel, every Babylon choice had a consequence that was not what you would expect at all. Um, and I'll tell you, in this particular instance, um, it wasn't what they expected because they said to Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. You think, praise God, yes, he can. But then they say, but if not, and that's extraordinary, we will not bow. And it shows, by the way, they weren't loving God for the perks. They weren't loving God for what he gave them. They were loving God for God's own sake. But anyway, those, it seems like they had two ideas in their head, that they'd be delivered from the furnace or they would die. Neither of those things happened. The unexpected outcome was that they were delivered in the furnace. And that was the extraordinary twist. And I want to leave us with a consideration of that. Um, God actually saved them in the fire. Um, And we must realize that being a Christian, following Christ, is not going to save us from the fires all the time. But sometimes for his own reason, he needs us to go into the fire that he might deliver us there, and the lesson from the passage in the whole book of Daniel is that he might do his most powerful work in that moment, a work towards you and in you, and a work towards Babylon and for his kingdom in Babylon. God works in fires. He just needs people to stand in them. He needs people who will say, I will not bow. He needs people to say, God might deliver me, he might not, or something else might happen, and usually it's the something else. And these guys, they took a stand in that fire, and and it's interesting, when Nebuchadnezzar looks in there, yes, he sees the fourth man, and we've dealt with that, Christ is with them in the fire, and Jesus says, behold, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth, right? So it's no surprise. Uh, But also, um, he looks in there and he says, I see them unbound, Is that a weird observation? Why are they unbound? I hope this isn't fanciful. I don't think it is. These guys are free. Why would we not go into the fire? We wouldn't go into the fire because of the things that hold us to this world. Because of the things that bind us to this world. All those things of reputation and standing and popularity and blah, 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 blah. You fill in the blank in your own life. Whatever it is that would hold you. I tell you what, when you trust Christ in the fires, you're released from them. You're freed from them. And that is a work that He will do in you for your good, more than so many others. And we need people who are freed from the cords of this world that bind them, so that they might serve God wholeheartedly. The Apostle Paul says, he says, talks about, what should, he talks about famine, he talks about tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and sword. And then he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not from all these things, God will always save us. No, in all these things. And that's the secret to a life in Babylon. The final secret is this. Um, and I've seen this in my own experience, actually. Um, There's so many things you read in Daniel and you think, wow, that is so true. It's the fires, actually, when God does some of his most powerful work in this culture, in this world. It is the testimony that emanates from God's people under fire, in challenge, in trouble, that saves souls, that reaches a pagan world with the gospel. Um, What happened with Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, first of all, he published a decree throughout the whole land, so these guys become world famous for what happened. I mean, the testimony goes around the world. It's like primetime television for a few nights. Uh, Everyone knows about it. Everyone knows about the God who delivered. No other God can deliver like this. What a testimony. A testimony that follows Daniel throughout the rest of the book, by the way. Everyone knows. Oh, get Daniel. You need him. Oh, Daniel's righteous. Let's go after him. All that kind of thing. You want a testimony? Stand in the fires. Um, But also, Nebuchadnezzar is ultimately converted. Isn't that extraordinary? 
This man, this is the second chapter of sort of three chapters of God working on him, and God was looking for someone who he could use, and he got Daniel in chapter two, and he got these three in chapter three, and then in chapter four, just to finish the job, God himself humbles him with lycanthropy, and he thinks he's got the mind, he's got the mind of a beast, and he goes mad for a time. And chapter four of Daniel is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. A megalomaniac, a despot, a killer. And do you know what? We'll meet him in heaven. Isn't it amazing? I mean, what did the Apostle Paul say? Um, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm chief. Well, he's got competition with Nebuchadnezzar, that's for sure. Uh, but God saved him. Manasseh, Paul, you and me, whoever we are. Um, you know, we must be challenged by this. We must be. Um, the context in which we're called to serve God has changed. We must come to terms with that. And the call on us in this context goes as no less than this. Will you stand with the fourth man in the fires? And you think you can't do that. Of course you can't, but he can and these men inspire us that in Babylon, God has a great work for us to do. And His kingdom will advance if we're ready to do that work and stand it with Christ instead of bowing to idols. Um, and when you belong to Jesus Christ, when He is truly Lord and King in your heart, and by the way, that was the secret. Nebuchadnezzar could conquer everything except their hearts. Couldn't get in there. That's what made him so angry. Couldn't change them. That was another king was in there, bigger than Nebuchadnezzar. But when he is your king, this is the kind of thing you will find yourself doing. I mean, not burning fiery furnaces, but trials. Things that come to you, boldness, courage. And you may be burdened by it, even as we talk about it tonight, but you'll be strangely exhilarated by it. That the God who reigns in heaven and in your heart may use you for eternal things against all odds. And what a legacy these guys had. A converted king, famous for their faith and their fear of God. And if you want anyone to be famous, you want these guys to be famous. A testimony in a light and a dark culture. I believe, by the way, the Magi who come to Jesus from the East. Daniel was chief of the Magi in the East. Um, there's a reason, there's a, he was a prophet. How did they know? Well, there's a legacy left that's intergenerational, but more than that, an eternal legacy. Actually, a legacy that comes to us today when we read the chapter. Look how God used them, but an eternal legacy. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And this is Daniel right now tonight. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right now tonight. He says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Babylon ends, folks, but that doesn't end. You're going in for what Babylon offers you, there'll be a last day when it's all gone, and the lament of Revelation, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the Great. But this goes on forever. When everything we have built here will be gone, what will we have on that day? God's glory and the glory of His servants is eternal. It never ends. And I want to leave us with the thought, will you share in it? Will you share with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the man they saved, they, by whose work they saved, God saved, Nebuchadnezzar, in that kingdom that will never end, looking back and speaking of the fires and praising God, exhilarated that He was pleased to use little old you and me in a Babylon to advance His course. And I want us to think seriously about that and say to you all, if you have not, turn to the fourth man in the fire. Let Him loose your bonds that tie you to other things. Trust Him. Serve Him. Lose Babylon, receive eternity, and you can do it tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for three men who were delivered in the fire. Thank you for their testimony and their example. 
Uh, and Lord, we know it's unlikely that such a thing will ever happen to us, but they give us strength, they give us um, knowledge that when that fourth man, the Son of God, stands with us in these fires, we too can serve you and you can do a work in us and you can do a work in our world that is eternal. Lord, we pray that all of us would commit ourselves to serve you. Lord, we pray that all of us would be ready and willing and able to be your servants in this time and this day, and that all of us would one day be in a place where we look back and we rejoice at all that God has done. Uh, Lord, receive us, uh, we pray, um, into your kingdom. Lord, I pray that those who are not there would seek you and find you, and that they would be praying to you right now. And Father, I pray that you would give us all good work to do towards that hope that lies up ahead. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.